Hi, this is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. And you're listening to the Personality Hacker Podcast. I wanted to read a question that we got from one of our listeners because I thought it was an excellent question. And we're going to dedicate the entire podcast to this small series of questions. It's, it's actually a couple different questions that she asked. And uh, this is from our listener, Andrea. And she says, so as an intuitive type, I'm very curious to learn more about what it's like to experience the world as a sensor. What motivates sensing types? What makes them feel good and what stresses them out? How can an intuitive mom help nurture the sensors around her so that everyone can shine? I thought this was an excellent series of questions. And then I realized that not everybody listening to this podcast might understand what she's talking about. What's the difference between an intuitive and sensor? What's she referring to? And what are these two different styles of people? So before you launch into the technical definitions, I just want you... I guess our audience, if you are the type this happened to, this happened to me when I was a little kid. I remember um, being young and going through life and and figuring stuff out in my life that I was surprised when I figured things out that some even grown-ups around me weren't able to figure out. At a young age, I was like, man, I am I smarter than other people? Am I, like, I can't be smarter. I know they're, they're also smart people, but... There's something I'm understanding about the world that other people aren't, or very few other people are. What's going on for me? And recently, obviously, based on what you're getting ready to explain, <laughs> I, was, I was using a process of learning about new information called intuition. And it was an incredible revelation for me, as somebody that's like this, to realize and recon back to my entire history of my childhood, my growing up, uh, my young adulthood, to see, wow, I had something really special I didn't even realize I had. In this particular podcast, we're going to talk about two different styles of human interaction that we could potentially be blind to. We might pick up that there are different styles that people operate with. I mean, we pick that up. That's how we understand things like, you know, personality psychology at all, that we tend to type other people. Even if we're doing it inexpertly, we still have a tendency to do this because we see that people are fundamentally different. One of the differences that we're going to talk about in this particular podcast is the difference between sensors and intuitives. So just to kind of give a framework around this, uh, this goes back to one of the most famous styles of typing other people using personality psychology, and that's the Myers-Briggs system. And the Myers-Briggs system is, uh, if you trace that back, is based on the work of Carl Jung. And what Carl Jung figured out is that there are two primary ways that people take in new information or learn new information. And he called them sensing and intuition. Now, those are actually get broken up even more so. They get a little more granular and that there's two different styles of sensing and two different styles of intuition. But we're not going to go that, that deep down the rabbit hole today. We're just going to talk about sort of the gross simplification of these two learning styles, which are sensing and intuition. So as I mentioned, they are the way that people learn new information. And they're really based on what's the most interesting thing to me to try to figure out as I'm taking in new content, like what's interesting to me. And so it seems that for people who have a sensory learning style, the things that are most interesting to them are what's reliable and verifiable. So when they're taking in a new piece of information, they want to know, okay, so is the, you know, is this information reliable? Are the sources reliable? Can I call somebody up and verify what you've just told me? Can I interact with it directly with my senses? And that's why they're called sensing types. Because they want verifiable, reliable information, uh, because they want it to be, you know, something that they can go make sure that that piece of information is true, they tend to trust information that they pick up using their senses. Now, senses go beyond just the five basic senses of touch, taste, smell, etc. You also have a sense of time, you have a sense of balance, you um, have a sense of temperature. We have all sorts of senses, you know, that our bodies are using to understand and calibrate information around. And so people who want reliable, verifi verifiable information tend to want to interact with that information using their senses. Now, there's another style of taking in and learning new information, and that is intuition. So just like sensors want information that is reliable and verifiable, those who use intuition more as their learning style 
want to know what's going on behind the curtain. They want, they want quick access to information and they want depth of insight. They want information that you can't necessarily interact directly with your senses. So because they want information that is behind the curtain, which is of course always behind the curtain and cannot be directly interacted with, yeah. then in order to know what that information is or to learn what that piece of information is, they have to go based on clues. And that ends up showing up as advanced pattern recognition. And so they're looking for little clues that they can see, interact with, with their senses that will give them more information about the, you know, an area that they can't see. They actually are far more interested and comfortable with the world of speculation. So we've got sensors who prefer the world of concrete, tangible, verifiable, um, you know, known information. And then we have intuitives on the other side, which are far more interested in the realm of speculation, in the world of pattern recognition, and being comfortable with things that maybe you can't directly interact with. Yeah, I heard a, an author write recently kind of in a loose way about intuition versus sensing. He said that um, uh, if intuitives have their head in the clouds, kind of, you know, speculating and observing what can't be seen or, or trying to make patterns about what can't be seen, uh, then sensors have their ear to the ground. They're, they're focused on what's happening here and now, and they're listening for what's going on currently and present. And they're more specific about, you know, tangible things. Yeah, exactly. They're more, they're more in touch with sort of the world around them and intuitives desire to be more in touch with the world that is coming. Um, they're more projection and uh, more um, sort of future paced. Or maybe not even future paced, maybe just, you know, not the, not the known tangible world. And so uh, this informs their interests uh, of the two different styles. A sensor is going to be interested in different things than an intuitive is going to be interested in and vice versa. This informs their focus. So yeah. our, it's not just our interest, but also the things that we're focused on. It's going to inform how we see time. What's more interesting, the here and now and the past or the future mm -hmm. and a possibility? Yeah. It's going to inform. It's basically, it's the old adage of two people are, you know, two blind people are interacting with an elephant and one is grabbing the trunk and one is grabbing the tail. Yeah. And so sensors are trunks and intuitives are tails or vice versa, however you want to see it. So what we end up doing is we end up coming at everything in a slightly different way. We're picking up different pieces of information. We're focused and understanding different mm -hmm. things. And what ends up happening is we have different needs. Yeah. We have different interests. We have different observations. We have different conclusions and we have different needs. And so as a parent, the person who is asking us that question is, look, I'm of the intuitive variety and I have a child of a sensory a variety. So mm -hmm. how do I make sure to get that child's needs met if I'm looking at different things? If I'm focused on something completely different than they're focused on, how do I make sure that I'm also taking their um, needs into consideration? I would say as an intuitive, so we haven't talked about the percentage breakdown of the population. There's been some research to indicate that 75%, around 75% of the population leads or uses an, an, a sensory way of understanding information. And only 25% of the population uses an intuitive way of understanding information. So, so basically you have 75% of the population focused on the here and now about tangible things, about uh, things that can be touched, verified, made sense of physically or, or specifically. And only 25% of that speculative nature where they're talking about, you know, colonizing space or right. <laughs> whatever crazy stuff that, you know, intuitives tend to tend to project and think about um, and pattern recognize about. And so that, that difference in the numbers make it so that our world is mostly occupied by people who have a sensory preference of learning. Yeah. And so the world is basically designed for sensors then in a, yeah. in a way because that's our, that, you know, that's they the largest the biggest, population. Yeah, they make the biggest. Well, that's and that's really interesting to think about. I mean, three fourths of the population. Yeah. Out of every four people that you meet, three of them are going to be sensory. That's a pretty big percentage of the population to or ha to have such a big disparity. Yeah. Um, I always think of this in terms of right-handed, left-handed. My mom and my brother are both left-handed. Right. And they've had to learn how to live in a world of right-handed people. Yeah. Like my mom has to use her dominant hand. 
uh, or her non-dominant hand to like mouse if she's yeah. like mousing on a computer. Use a mouse. Use a mouse. Mousing a, is mousing. funny. Is mouse, isn't that, isn't that the, the verb? <laughs> isn't that the technical term? To mouse. <laughs> Someone, someone, come on and leave a comment. Let us know the actual technical definition of mousing or to mouse or to be moused. <laughs> to be mousing. I don't right. know. I think uh, it's to use a mouse. To use a mouse. I think Whatever. mouse is the noun. She uses her right hand. You understand what I meant. Yeah. So she's using her non-dominant hand. And she said to do scissors and everything in her life. Like, right. Everything's had to be done with her hand that's not her dominant hand. Right. And uh, she's just had to learn how to cope. And like. Yeah live in the world that's not designed for her, basically. Yeah. Well, and I'm right-handed, and I don't... I never... Do you ever think about it? <laughs> never think about left-handed. I don't either. Like, none of my mental real estate goes to the problem of being left-handed. I don't care about left-handers. <laughs> I don't care. I really don't care what <laughs> like, happens to these people. I mean, I remember in, like, kindergarten, there was this series of left-handed scissors, and I remember picking them up one time and trying to use them. I remember going, this is weird, and then throwing them back in the scissor pile and picking up the right-handed scissors, and then never thinking about it again. Why can't these people be right-handed? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, well, and that's what people used to think, right? Didn't left-hand actually originally come from oh, yeah. the word that meant like sinister well she had to wear like some kind of spe- in school you know she had to wear some kind of special like wrist thing so she could write certain ways and like all this extra stuff right and i think it was you mean so she could write with her right hand no oh. with her left hand but they had to like train it in a certain way and i remember her telling me a story i think it was i think it might be my grandmother who they actually forced to do things in school right-handed they would not cater to her left-handedness at all right and so now she's right-handed but she's not probably as as good at it as she could have been had she, you know, her dominant hand is not as skillful as an actual right-handed person because she's had to force herself in using her right hand. So basically they forced her to be ambidextrous. Basically. And that's, oh, that is a, such a fantastic illustration for the difference between sensors and intuitives because it's about the same percentage breakdown. Yeah. Like I think about 25 to 30% of the population is, is left-handed and whereas, you know, 70 to 75 percent of the population is right-handed and i don't think of anybody who occupies you know any of their or like relegates any of their mental real estate to the the question of left-handedness like if you're a right-hander the whole world is designed for you and you just take that for granted you don't even think about it whereas for a left-handed person this is on your mind on a daily basis because you're forever having to sort of you know reprogram yourself to fit into a world that's not designed for you and this is the same, this is basically the same thing that sensors and intuitives deal with. Most of the percentage of the population is sensory. And there's a smaller percentage that is intuitive. So what you see is that intuitives have a tendency to be sort of ambidextrous. Like they are able to speak uh, sensory language. They're able to understand the sort of the world that sensors have created, they're the ones who are much better at sort of, you know, blending in with sensors. Whereas sensors don't, like, they don't think about intuitives. Like, that's not even something that they think about. They might have run into somebody who had some what they would consider wacky ideas at one point, or they may have, um, you know, they might have interacted with a person that felt different to them. But other than that, they don't, I mean, it's like, it's like the equivalent to me picking up those left-handed scissors and going, that was weird. And then yeah. never thinking about it again. Now, if you're married to somebody who's left-handed, suddenly now left-handedness becomes part of your life. Like exactly. even if you're right-handed, suddenly now you have to like think about this person's left-handed experience and how you're going to maybe change things logistically a little bit to, you know, to cater to their left-handedness. But if you're, if you know, if you're right-handed and marry another right-hander, again, never think about it. Well, so our, our listener who wrote in really is in a kind of an advantage of advantage position because she's the intuitive in the relationship. Her child is the sensor. The way that her child would learn would be through a sensory process. She learns through intuition. She probably already has some skill built in being bilingual and being, mm-hmm. you know, uh, learning style ambidextrous, if you will. Yeah. And uh, so that's an advantage. The other advantage is that her sensor child now has the ability to understand. Uh, the intuitive plight of being kind of the minority, you know, right, like, yeah. she can basically help her understand, Hey, uh, there are other people in the world that don't necessarily think like you do. They think in a different fashion. And I've had to, you know, I've had to bridge the gap there and here's some ideas on how that looks. Yeah. So there's some advantages for her. Actually. Right. Well, and, and I, I just kind of want to focus a little bit on this split a little bit more before we start talking about specifics mm-hmm. on how to meet the needs of people who might have a learning style that's different than yours. One thing that I have noticed, just like, 
just like I mentioned that, you know, right-handed people, myself being one of them, <clears throat> never think about left-handers. Sensors don't really think about intuitives. Like, that's not really something that, you know, that, that's not on their radar at all. Uh, whereas intuitives are very aware of sensors. And because intuitives have a tendency to feel, um, what is the word, not diminished, but, you know, kind of marginalized by sensory thinking, uh, they have a tendency to think sensors are dumb or idiots or stupid or have all sorts of, you know, tasty little names that they, they call sensors because they feel to some extent victimized by the fact that nobody's thinking about them. Mm-hmm. Now, this shows up, up, up in a couple different ways. Because intuitives don't have any problem with speculation, they end up getting better and better over time at utilizing their intuitive process of pattern recognition. I I should probably just make a comment really quick. Um, I realized that this is really important for the conversation. All people have both abilities uh, Mm -hmm. for taking in information. Yeah. All right. So we, even if we are quote unquote intuitives in say the Myers-Briggs system, we have a sensory part of us. And all the people who are sensors in the Myers-Briggs system have an intuitive part of them. We have access to, to both sides. Yeah. We're not talking about whether or not you have any ability to do both. It's what your natural wiring has a preference for. Your desires, basically. Right. So some people have a strong, natural, hardwired preference for sensory ways of thinking. And others have a natural hardwired preference for intuitive ways of thinking and you can't really do anything about that like there's some evidence to indicate that our personality type is in our dna so there's not i mean you didn't really choose it it got chosen for you so if you're a sensor or an intuitive there's no reason to feel either better or less (laughs) like it's just like that's what you got out of the blister packaging (laughs) like like you didn't you didn't decide at one point to be sensory or intuitive this is how it is and there's a genius in both i mean there's a genius in all of this Mm -hmm. there's a there's a way of acting in the world and learning about the world that's unique to you whether it's sensory or intuitive right and you're really good at it because our the reason why we're so good at our preferences is because we clock so many hours using them and if we're particularly you know uh smart about how we go about life we're not just using our mental processes we're actually exercising them so we're not just you know engaging in the world in sort of this half-assed way we're actually you know, building challenges for ourselves and overcoming our challenges. So those who exercise their, their brain, right? So exercise their preferences. It doesn't matter what personality type you are, you will get to your highest level of proficiency and you will be a definite gift for the world, right? To the world, your personality will be a gift to the world. So that said, we all have access to both styles. Like if we didn't, then an intuitive would not be able to walk into their house and like, you know, like enter the door as opposed to run into it right like we would not be able to understand temperature change so obviously we have we have sensory abilities and if you know if a sensor didn't have any intuition they couldn't walk into a room and notice when a piece of furniture was you know not in its proper location because they would have no pattern recognition abilities yeah Uh, they would not know hey maybe don't step in front of a car because even though it's like you know 200 meters away, it's going to hit you if you walk out in front of it. So obviously we have access to both sides and we need both sides. We need both a sensory way of entering the world and an intuitive way of entering the world. However, we end up, we end up having a preference, which is again, hardwired into us. It's our wiring that does it. And when you're an intuitive, Your preference for intuition means that you're going to be doing more pattern recognition. And just like anything, when you use and exercise something over time, when you clock a lot of hours doing it, you get really good at it. So what ends up with intuitives is that they get good at prediction. They get good at, you know, just stupid little things like when you watch a movie, you kind of know how it's going to end. Like intuitives get better about things like that. They see where things are going. They make quick estimations. Um, they're, they're better at just kind of determining where something is headed. Or they're really good at seeing possibilities, right? They, they understand the relationship between two disparate you know, objects that other people would say, there, there's no relationship there. An intuitive gets better at pa- you know, being able to recognize sort of the pattern of how these two things correlate or fit. Yeah. Whereas sensors get really good at uh, things like, um, you know, they get good at sports <laughs> as a general rule. They get really good at being able to see what's reliable information. A lot of sensors end up being like detectives because they get really good at 
picking up clues, like minute little details, they start spotting those really easily. Mm -hmm. So there's definitely advantages to both. But that said, because sensors don't really understand how intuitives work because they're not really thinking about them, what ends up happening with an intuitive is they end up speculating on something that they feel pretty confident is, is gonna happen or is the truth, right? They make a speculation. There's no concrete evidence for it. However, all of the signs point to this. And um, as an intuitive, because intuitives get really good at being intuitive, they're pretty sure they're right. Yeah. Then they bring this speculation to the world and the world says, prove it, <laughs> right? Prove it. And the intuitive goes, I, I, I don't know why I think this is true. I don't know if I can prove it. I can show you some evidence that might prove it, but I don't know if I can specifically prove it. And then the world goes, well, then it's not true. Yeah. The thing I think of the 1970s, there are, are giant supercomputers at IBM and other major c c companies. And um, an intuitive thinker named Steve Jobs said, I can envision a computer actually sitting on everybody's desk in their home. People are like, are you out of your mind? They take up entire rooms. Like these things are enormous. You're talking about reducing them down to the, the place where they could be on people's desks in their homes. Are you crazy? He's like, I just see it. I can see that happening. I can see the connections being made. And people are kind of like, that's just not reliable. That's not specific data that we can see happening. Right. And it's so this not is an kind of, is. This is not an is that's already been here. Like right. You're dreaming of something in the future. I don't, I don't see that. That sounds insane to me. That sounds crazy. Right. And yet, what do we see? We see not only that, we see computers in our pockets now. Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, you know, it was even beyond what he was able to imagine back then. Yeah. So it's this idea that you're, you're seeing things, you're seeing where things are going to be going. Um, you're seeing what, what could be. Um, not what is in some of those ways. Well, and that's the nice thing about being an intuitive is that you have the ability, if you if you are on point, you have the ability to bring these speculations, these possibilities into reality. Well, now, I mean, now that our generation was born into a time period where we had computers on our desks, I mean, like with me, my parent, my family's very first computer was the Commodore 64. And I think I was like six. Right. Yeah. Like maybe five or six, maybe seven at the most. And so I've been raised in a world where computers are on our tables and, you know, most of my peers are the same way. And you don't see any sensors at this point going, that's ridiculous. <laughs> right. Because it is a reality. Yeah. Right. Like it is like nobody's going computers don't exist <laughs> because they have one right there. <laughs> you know, they're listening to our podcast on it right now. So um, it's definitely a matter of, you know, intuitives help bring possibilities into reality. And then what's great about sensors is that sensors have the ability to maintain that new reality. Like yeah. the reality that is, sensors work that in that world very well and they're ex excellent at maintenance. They're excellent at, at making, you know, keeping infrastructure going. And so you can see that 75-25 split as being very, like probably just right. You can't have too many innovators in the world because otherwise you continue to reinvent the wheel unnecessarily. Yeah. And you can't have only people who are maintenancing because if that's the case, then no progress gets made. So you, it's, it's kind of like the intuitives sort of help lead us to the next phase and the sensors make sure that the intuitives don't, you know, create mushroom clouds on the way. Yeah. It's a throttling of, of advancement in the sorts, the way it breaks out, basically. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I mean, sensors are absolutely brilliant at creating some sort of like, um, uh, once the prototype gets made, incorporating it into some sort of, uh, what is the word? Um, not regulation, but sort of like a... Um, System or process. Uh, what's the word? It's like, it's like now that's the new norm. What is that word? Do you know what I'm talking about? It's uh, assimilation. <laughs> Maybe. I can't what remember what the word is. But basically it's like, okay, so we have, oh, standard. Standard, That's yeah. the word I was looking for. So standard. So we have like a standard wheel size or set of wheel sizes for all cars. So when you go to get new wheels put on your car, it's not like every single car has to have customized wheels put on their car. Like yeah. we have standardized wheels. Sensors are fantastic at setting up those systems. Let's create some standards so that you don't have to have everything be massively customized. Yeah. Um, whereas the intuitives are the ones who are like, hey, let's put wheels on cars and make them go by themselves without horses. Yeah. So it's definitely a great relationship that they have with each other if they learn to appreciate the other. Totally. So two things. The first thing I want to say um, is this is really the core. Uh, we're really getting into territory that is the core of what Personality Hacker is all about, is understanding um, this this difference between sensory and intuition. Now, Personality Hacker does a lot of different things, obviously. We've got a lot of different trainings, a lot of different resources, a lot of different uh, 
uh, classes and products and things like that. But what we're talking about right now, this sensor versus intuitive learning style split is really the core of what we do. And, and if you're interested in more about this, um, come over to our website. We've got a lot of resources about this. There's an entire course just talking about it. If you're, a, if you're resonating with what we're talking about for intuition, we have an entire course called Intuitive Awakening that really talks about these differences and goes into, into great depth about you as an intuitive learning style, making your way in a sensor world and making your way in the world in general. So I just want to kind of throw that out as, as that's something as a resource for you to use if, if you think you might have intuition as a learning style and you're listening. So the second thing I want to say, do you, do you, want to, do you have some more to say about that or do you want to delve into talking about our, re, our listener's question specifically? No, I want to go into the question. I okay. think that's great. Well, I think that we've set it up enough to kind of give sure. them- uh, would you say like I agree, a good yeah. fleshed out kind of concept between these two styles? And that's why I mentioned to go to the website. If you're if you want to dive into this more, we've got so much more to talk about this. Yeah. You know, over there that you can get that th- at, at the website. Yeah, and there's a blog post too that we wrote about the difference between sensors and, in, and intuitives. So yeah. feel free if you want to see this parsed out a little bit better. Um, go to the personality hacker blog. Uh, yeah, the 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 um, area that says blogs and uh, look for sensor versus intuitive. Cool. And um, and that will give you kind of a, a, a little bit more fleshed out definition between the two. Sure. So let's tackle that question then. So uh, basically the question was, you know, how do I interact with my sensory child? How do I understand what their needs are? How do I make sure that as an intuitive parent, I'm acknowledging the needs of my sensory child? And what's great about this co- uh, conversation or this question is it could also go in the reverse. If you happen to be somebody who's a sensor, how do you deal with an intuitive child? Which might even be more complicated or difficult because it's like, as a right-hander, how do you deal with a left-handed kid? Yeah. <laughs> as opposed to saying, as a left-hander, how do I deal with a right-handed kid? Did I say that right? Yeah, yeah okay. you did. Um, so uh, here's what I would say. When you're dealing with children, recognize that they're going to be particularly sensitive in their preferred form of learning. If you are an intuitive, what's great is that you're going to try to pick up patterns of your child's behavior and sort of make an estimation of, you know, well, that worked and this didn't work and maybe that worked. And you might be a little bit better about the test iterate process because you're trying to figure out, you're trying to master this. This is a challenge that you're trying to master. As a sensor with an intuitive kid, it might be more frustrating because you're trying to use the things that you know work for you. And this kid is an anomaly, right? Like you don't know yeah. anybody like this kid. Yeah. So if that's the case, then it might be even more confusing. Whereas an intuitive is used to having to figure things out as they go because the world is not necessarily designed for them. So that said, uh, to specifically answer the question, one of the things that I, I wrote back to her, um, and, and I wanted to mention this too, is that I wrote back to her just a short little private message that basically said, remember that sensory children are more sensitive to their sensory environment. Mm. Whereas intuitives have a tendency to be sort of one degree of separation from their senses, like sort of from their body. Yeah. So what I noticed is, um, so you have a sensory son. Yeah. Who is my stepson. And what I've noticed is little things that I would not be thinking about, like like if we're on a car trip, mm-hmm. the temperature in the car. He's very aware of. He's the first one to mention. Yeah. Like he's like, I'm hot. Can you put on the air conditioning? Or I'm cold. Can you put on the heat? Like he's the first person in our entire family. And I'm pretty sure the rest of the family has an intuitive bent. Yeah. He's the first person to register temperature. Yeah. And making sure that we're accommodating his physical comfort Right? Like mm-hmm. if he's too hot or too cold or whatever, this translates as caring for him. Yeah. It's not just like an afterthought. It's not just like, a, oh, okay, so I'll throw on the air conditioning. It's like it, it, he knows that we love him when we check in with him. Mm-hmm. So what I've started to do is when I think about it, because I don't always think about it, but when I think about it, I always go, hey, how you doing back there temperature wise? Yeah. And this is me showing him love. I, I've noticed the other thing that happens with my son in situations, and these are just personal stories, but... Um, he has a tendency because uh, my other my other son and most likely our daughter together and both of us are all intuitives. Uh, we all have a tendency to start getting on a, a intuitive kick, like where we're moving and we're pattern recognizing together potentially. And he kind of feels a little left out and a little bit marginalized in this context, which is very unique for him because other everywhere else in the world he's going to fit in very well. Uh, but kind of like 
he gets bored with what we're talking about quickly and he wants to get back to like the basics of talking about things that he can understand and are, are specific and tangible again. Mm-hmm. And uh, being sensitive to that to bring some of those elements into conversation, to, into activities, things that will make him feel like he's back grounded again are helpful. And that's something I have to remember because I'm very intuitive. I like to speculate and stuff. So I have to think about that. I can't think of any specific examples right now. I'm trying. I'm like racking my brain because I, I see your eyes looking at me like, "Can you give me an example?" I'm like, oh man, I think it's storytelling. One of them, like when yeah. we're doing like, um, like if we'll be telling stories, like my intuitive son will get really excited, and we're, the intuition level of like getting real abstract and real crazy about the stories, mm-hmm. and my sensor son's more like, "Okay, let's let's, let's get bring it." back down to where I can understand what's going on here because you're talking about going to space and like color, right. you know like crazy stuff that doesn't make sense to me right now as a, as a kid who's a sensor we build we build family stories yeah uh, we have this sort of habit where we talk about we'll be on an adventure mm-hmm. and we'll plant things for them we do this uh, a lot where we'll go someplace and as part of like an overarching story that we're telling in the moment, we'll plant little items for them to find as treasures. Yeah. So we had this big story about, you know, Korgoresh the dragon and um, Pendulum the wizard who controlled Korgoresh the dragon with a ring. And we had this like fairy, I can't remember what the fairy's name was. This has been a little bit since this particular story, but the fairy found the ring and um, and, and and hid it in a place where they could find it to destroy it so that Korgoresh would no longer be under Pendulum's spell. I mean, like, it gets really elaborate. So they find this ring, and they're just, like, flipping their lids about how awesome this is, right? And um, and then they get to go destroy the ring. So we had them take this, like, 25-cent, you know, like, vending Cracker machine, Jack. Cracker Jack ring, and they destroyed it with a rock. Well, I think what was really nice is that it's not that your sensory kid, it's not like he's not into this, but I think putting it into physical, tangible things like the ring, yeah. right? And being able to destroy the ring really brought him into the story. Because otherwise, when we just stay on the abstract, it's like he's he's kind of, he has a little bit of trouble kind of caring. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like until we start bringing it into the, the physical, tangible, then he really gets into it. So I, I think um, for the rest of us, I think we probably could stay in the just the realm of the abstract thinking about it, but when we bring it down to sort of physical, you know, physical tangible place, he really feels like he's a part of it. He appreciates that. Mm-hmm. The other thing I've noticed about him, and and I'll say this, and we can kind of give some maybe prescriptive ideas. Um, he is really all about verifying information all the time. He'll come up to me and be like, "Okay, Dad, so policemen are always good, right, Dad? Right?" And I'll be like, "Well," and I want to give him like a contextual like. You know, he's six, but I want to give him a contextual answer about police. But he wants to, like, have this very verifiable piece of information about... And he's putting things in categories and, like, things that he can try to understand. So he's like, okay, so that guy in that movie is a bad guy, right? I'm like, well, he's kind of the bad guy. He's got, you know, like, I'm trying to explain the nuance of this. But he wants to know the specifics and the the definitions of things, the verifiability of things. He's always asking me clarifying questions about the world and how things work, and he's trying to compartmentalize all these so he can make sense of it. Mm-hmm. Whereas my other son's more like open to the gray area of things. Like he's not so he doesn't have to be so locked down in like verifiable information. He's okay with speculative type conversation and and identification. He understands that somebody might be good and bad in right. in a movie, for example. Yeah. Um, and my youngest son wants to go one way or the other. He's more specifically one or the other, not both. It's the gray area is hard for him to manage. Yeah, and I think. That could be youth, by the way, too. It could be. Obviously, it could be as a age. Kid. I think, though, that I mean, I've noticed that he also, your sensory kid, asked the question of, you know, are we allowed to do this mm-hmm. a lot? Like, if we're if we're like walking along some area that's quote unquote, you know, off the path, off the beaten path, the first question he asks is, are we allowed to do this? Yeah. He wants to verify that we're not going to get in trouble by an authority figure. I think this is another piece that because sensors are infrastructurally minded, um, because they have a tendency to want to make sure that, you know, they're they're not they're not getting too out there. If you get too out there, you might break the system. There's like something sort of unconsciously that reminds them of that. They want to make sure that when you take an action, that you're not doing something that would be harmful, right? Mm-hmm. Like you're not doing something bad, mm-hmm. um, especially as a little kid sensor. 
And that's not to say that censors will never be rebellious, but I think that that's sort of the that's sort of the difference is that oftentimes when censors are doing something that they're quote unquote not supposed to be doing, it will be a form of rebellion for them. Whereas intuitives have a tendency to simply ignore that the rules are you know referring to them in the first place. Yeah. Right. So intuitives when they do something quote unquote bad, it's not because they're you being rebellious or bad or like you know bucking the system. It's because they just don't think the rules apply to them. Yeah. And so because we're intuitives, we have a tendency to do stuff that's like off the beaten path. And the first thing that your sensor son asks is, are we allowed to do this? Well, it's really good as intuitive parents to sort of check in with the kid and make them feel safe. Mm-hmm. Make them realize that it's okay. What we're doing is not going to be, you know, it's not, we're not going to break anything. We're not going to be unsafe in this context. It's going to be fine. And as intuitives, we don't really register safety on the same level. I think sensors have a tendency to want safety, not even physical safety so much as sort of mimetic safety. Verifiable safety. Yeah, like they want to make sure that they're not they're not hurting anything or yeah. going to be hurt. Yeah. In any way whatsoever. So one thing that you can do for a sensory child as well is to sort of verify the safety of something. It's going to be okay. Nobody's going to get in trouble. Nobody's going to get hurt. We're all going to be fine. And that we've got it. I think that's another thing is securing the perimeter for a sensory child is very important for them. And by securing the perimeter, I mean making sure that they realize that as parents, you've got it. Like, it's going to be fine. Like, we've got it under control. If anything goes haywire, we're going to handle it. You don't have to think about it. You can just stay a kid. I think all kids appreciate that. However, I've noticed that our sensory child is way more uh, uh, appreciative of that than our um, than our intuitive kid. Yeah, I would agree with that. So I guess getting back to the original question, you know, I mean, the gist of it is how do I relate? Like, how do I, you know, as I'm raising this as an intuitive parent, I'm raising a sensor child. What do I do? What are some pitfalls to avoid? What are some things that could trip me up? What are, you know, wh- how do I go about going about this, mm-hmm. I guess, is the question. So let's talk about maybe some real specific ideas that we can get down to more, um, we've been in the intuitive speak. Let's yeah. let's get more sensor based and get more specific about this. Well, I, I will say something that's a little bit intuitive, uh, a little sure. more abstract to start it no, out. No, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, that is one of the worst mistakes you can make, and we all do it. So we all make this terrible, terrible mistake. Uh, that is to overvalue your own experience. Yeah. We all do it. We can't help it. We all overvalue our own experience and our own opinion. And so... It's the only one I have. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's the only experience I have. So I'm making the assumption that everybody else is experiencing the same thing. And one of the biggest mistakes you can make is when you see differences in your child, assuming that that is brokenness. I see this happen over and over with parents and kids. They see their kid as different than them. And because they would not behave that way or they would not respond that way, they assume that there's something wrong with their kid. It's like a defect. Yeah. When really it could just be different wiring. So... The first thing you can do as a gift to your child, regardless of whether or not you're intuitive, their sensor, or vice versa, or whatever, is to look at your child and instead of first going, oh, there must be something wrong with them, they must have a disorder, or they must have, you know, they must have something that requires medication. Sometimes they do, but sometimes they don't. Uh, As opposed to assuming that that's a sign of brokenness in them, hold space for the different wiring that they most assuredly have from you. Because your kids are probably going to be wired just a little different. Yeah. That there is some indication that this is inherited. Personality type is inherited. But you've got a lot of different things to inherit from. You've got two batches of family and two batches of grandparents and two batches of great grandparents. You know what I mean? Like the family tree grows pretty expansive. And yeah. they can get their personality type. This is, I mean, people say this all the time. Oh, you, the, my, my daughter makes me think of my mom. Yeah. Or my son makes me think of my uncle or whatever, or my brother. So there is inheritedness, but that doesn't mean it's direct from you. So they're probably going to be wired just a little different. So hold some space for that. Yeah. Go, okay, you're different than me. And that doesn't mean that you're bad. You're just like your father. Yeah, exactly. Right? <laughs> Sometimes that happens. And that, and you might have all sorts of like negative anchors to who that father is. That doesn't mean that the little kid, because yeah. they're wired the same, is going to have the same behaviors necessarily. Absolutely. I think that's a really key. And I think it really, um, being a, again, going back to the specific question from a specific listener, having a sensor child, they're going to most likely fit in with society fairly easily. Yeah, they'll get the rules a little better. Because society, like we talked about, is made for sensor learning style people. 
Um, if you have an intuitive child, this is where it gets a little more sticky because they're going to have a very different way of viewing the world than the most of their peers that they're in school and growing up around. And yeah. so that's going to cause a whole dynamic of challenges and differences that especially if you lead with a process, you lead with a learning style of sensory uh, data and input, um, that's going to create a whole other level of challenges for you as a sensor parent, somebody who sees the world sensorily. Uh, with an intuitive learning style child, that's going to really be a, a interesting combination for you. You're gonna, you're more likely to think your kid's broken. If you are listening to this podcast, though, as a sensory parent, you are opening yourself to learning new information, and you're open. I would assume by listening to this to understanding how your child ticks, and I commend you for that. And there's probably a lot of hope for you because, <laughs> and <laughs> well, yeah. your and your family and yeah. your child because that's really cool that you're able to do that and you're willing to do that as a sensor parent. Absolutely. So some concretes are uh, well. The first thing you can do is you can go get your personality type um, figured out. You can go to our assessment, the Genius Style Assessment on PersonalityHacker.com. Uh, there's a host of other. Uh, simple Myers Briggs tests online. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, like you can go, you can go take online tests and figure out what your style is. Um, That'd be a first step. That would be a first step. If you if you end up taking the Genius Style assessment, it's not going to be written in Myers Briggs terms. So if you end up, just as a quick key, if you end up as sensation or memory, that means you're a sensor style of learning. And if you end up as perspectives or exploration, that's an intuitive style of learning. So that's the first thing you can do is you can go take an online, our online assessment I think is great. So you can take our online assessment and figure out what, what style you are. That's at personalityhacker.com. If I was a parent listening, I would say, can my child be tested? It was the first question that would come to my mind. Well, and, uh, and you can, you can take the test for them. It's an adult questionnaire. So they might not be able to answer all of them and you might have to take make some guesses. I believe that there is, I don't remember what the website is, but I do remember that there is one for, uh, oh, it's is it personality page? Well, we can post it under the podcast. Yeah, we'll, po we'll post it on their podcast, a link to a child assessment. Um, that said, yeah, you can test your kid on one of these and figure out what theirs is. Again, if they're sensation or memory, that makes them a sensory learning style. Or if they're perspectives or exploration, that makes them a, an intuitive learning style in our genius style system. And so, um, so yeah, take a test for both of you and kind of figure out what the differences are. And then on top of that... Hold space for your kids' differences. And then on top of that, make sure that you are checking in with them. If they're a sensory child, make sure you're checking in with that safety tr trigger. Make sure that they feel like you've got it handled. Make sure that you're asking them questions um, or indicating that you are handling the, the situation physically and logistically and memetically. Make sure that you're checking in with them on a physical level, their comfort levels, that indicates love to them generally. Make sure they feel physically comfortable and that things aren't too threatening. If you've got an intuitive kid, the big thing is don't look at them and see some sort of defect. Allow them to have sort of this wild speculative imagination. Allow them to be a little weird. Give them some breathing room. Give basically. them some breathing room, exactly. They're gonna be a little weird. They're probably gonna be really interested in things like reading at a very young age. They're probably going to have interests in things that don't make any sense to you. Uh, I know of intuitive kids that at a very young age start picking up philosophy or science. Uh, they start picking up things like, um, you know, psychology. And they aren't necessarily always going to think that the rules apply to them. They might, they might need some patience from you and some understanding to explain why the rules, you know, at least your house rules will be applying to them until they leave the house. Yeah. So that's, that's something that they might not get immediately. And that doesn't mean that they're simply being rebellious. It's that their brains just aren't wired to see rules as applying to them. So maybe a little bit more patience in explaining the rules. Um, maybe more patience in seeing a direct correlation between them and their environment. Um, they might not understand why a messy room means that much to them. So just kind of maybe some patience and more sitting down and talking with them, which really actually um, is, is far more cohesive to an intuitive style anyway. I started out this podcast with a story about my childhood and how I viewed the world as a young person growing up. And one of the things that I think I would have loved to have at a young age is someone to tell me, hey, listen, what you're going through, what you're experiencing by advanced pattern recognizing things, the way you learn is very different than most people. Um, and it's, it's unique, it's special, it's called intuition. Here's how it works. 
here's how you can use it, and here's how to make your way in the world with this as a skill, as a, as a talent, as a natural preference. Um, rather than thinking that there's something weird or wrong with you, this is actually a good thing. And you're in school, it might not play out well for you with certain teachers or other kids, uh, different places in life, here's the hiccups you're gonna have, here's the struggles that you're gonna have, here's the things that people are gonna be like, man, you're a weirdo, you're, you're different, why are you thinking this way? If someone had come at the age of eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, somewhere in that range and told me some of this stuff, even as a teenager, I would've been like, that is incredible, I never knew this existed, I didn't know this, this type of learning style was there, no wonder I think this way. No yeah. wonder I, I'm not weird. I just think differently than other people sometimes. Yeah. And I think that would also be helpful. So if you do have the ability to identify your child as in, intuitive, um, explaining that to them is something that I think is very beneficial. At least it would have been. I, I'm sure you would have loved to know all this when oh, you were totally. a kid. Um, uh, there's a, there's one product that we made. I, I just It just dawned on me. <laughs> Sometimes I forget what we have available. There is one product that we made last summer called Personalities in Children and Family. Oh, yeah. Or Family and Children. I can't remember. Personalities in Family and Children, I believe. It's available on our website, personalityhacker.com, under relationships. And that's really fun um, because that program goes into a lot of the dynamics, not just between you and your children, but also between like you and your mate and your children yeah. and your children together and you and sort of the family dynamic that happens when you've got all these different personality types coming together. There's a lot of exercises, diagramming that out, mm -hmm. kind of figuring out how those interpersonal relationships work. Exactly, exactly. And I think that that's where I remember posting a, uh, a um, test, an assessment for children. It was uh, in the in the relationship event or okay. the, the relationship in children and family or family and children. Um, I think it's children and family. I, if you want to go to further down this rabbit hole, go get that program. That program is great for really understanding family dynamics and having more tools in your tool belt for interacting with your child using models and uh, understanding how the mind works, you know, maps and models of the human mind. And applying that to, you know, raising your kid and having a great relationship with them all throughout, you know, their entire childhood from baby up to, you know, to, to leaving the house. Yeah. So I do recommend going and checking that program out if you want to go further down the rabbit hole. But that said, you know, as, as just something that's a really easy thing to do, go take the genius style assessment at personalityhacker.com. Take the genius style assessment and, uh, and I'll post a link to the children's test. Uh, which is a pretty good one. Yeah. And um, and then you can kind of just from there extrapolate maybe some things that would be right for you and your family, you and your child. And remember that one of the best gifts you can give to your kids is some space for them to have different wiring than you and understand that they might not be the same type as you. Yeah. And we love to talk about this stuff. So come over to personalhacker.com. Uh, leave a comment under this podcast. We also are on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash personality hacker. Or you can find us on Twitter which is just personality hack, H-A-C-K. And uh, please have a discussion with us. Let us know if you have more questions, comments, if you'd like to have a discussion. We love talking about this. We'd love to engage with you um, online and, uh, and have you be part of our, part of our community here of advancing, uh, advancing humanity forward. So uh, I'm Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. And this has been the Personality Hacker Podcast. We'll talk to you next time. Thank you